So with our rule, if you're the last one here, you have to bring donuts. <laughs> if you stale and you don't have to be left <laughs> over for the city council meeting. <laughs> For some meetings where the city council doesn't show. <laughs> All right, we're going to go ahead and get started. This is the Ward One Neighborhood Advisory Board meeting for Monday, March 13th. Can I get a roll call, please? Ginsburg? Here. Daft Terry? Here. Piskovich? Absent this time. Ross? Here. Shrimp? Here. Tyson? Here. Wager? Here. Morning House. Absent this time. Mr. Chair, you have a quorum. All right, thank you. We're going to move on to item A2. This is public comment. This item is for either public comment on any action items or any general public comment and is limited to no more than three minutes for each commentator. Gail Jacks. Stand up. <laughs> um, I have a question about the city council meeting. Um, I live in a building right next to Barbara Park. I am literally right next to the park. I understand that there's going to be some changes to the park, but my building has not been notified. We are the exit from the park. We, to my idea, could be notified of some changes and maybe have some input. Uh, we've got homeless all around us. We have ideas that there might be a pickleball board coming in, but the parking already is preserved. And I mean baloney berserk. And people try to use the, the river with their rafts, with their children at festivals. Oh my goodness. At holidays. Oh my goodness. So we would have liked to have been notified or still would like to be notified of what you're thinking of planning. There are 12 units there. Right next to us is a retirement center. It is our only driveway to our building. It is the driveway to the building next door, and it is the ingress and egress for emergency vehicles. There's also a unit at the very end called 600 Island. I don't know who lives there, but it's their only ingress and egress. It would be very nice if there's supposed to be public comment if we could be asked for our comment. That's all I have to say. We'd like to be notified. We'd like to be talked to, please. Thank you for your comments, Gail. Is there anyone else in the room who would like to give public comment today? I would direct the members. We did receive one public comment through our online public comment portal. Um, it's not related to a specific agenda item, but it is included in your packet at the end of the initial agenda. Would anyone present on Zoom like to give public comment today? If you'd like to give public comment on Zoom, please use the raise hand feature in your Zoom function. Seeing none, Mr. Chair, we can move on. Like I mentioned to you before, that this would be good for you to bring the parks and rec to this public. Should the parks and rec come to us? If it's on the agenda. Yes, they should. Okay. Moving on to item A3 approval of the agenda for tonight's meeting, March 13, 2023. There is a change. The B1 Reno Fire Department will not be here this evening, but they've sent some information. So that will be off the agenda. Yes, sir. That's off the agenda. The information the fire department sent along is included next to your packets. I apologize that it's not included in the packets. They sent it over after I printed them, um, but it will be included in the official record. Um, but that item will not be on today's agenda. Right. So we need a motion to approve tonight's agenda. Motion. Second. That's Jerry and Rhonda for the record. So Thank you, Mr. Chair. All those in favor say aye. 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 Anyone opposed? Aye. Hearing none, we'll move on to item A4, the approval of the minutes from the February 13th, 2023. 
meeting. Has everybody had a chance to review those? I have a question. Okay. Who wrote these? Our minute taker um, that we contract for all the NAVs wrote these minutes. Nice job. I just okay. wanted to say they were. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I'm scared. Yeah. No, no, they were. She does a she does a really good job. So we love you. Just it. wanted to comment on how well done I thought they were. Excellent. I'll be very pleased to hear that. All right. So we'll need a motion to approve. Move to approve. All right. Rhonda first. Gary second. All those in favor say aye. 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 Anyone opposed? And here to the other. Member Dapteri and Shrimp, if you could please indicate your support or not of approving the minutes. I approve. Sorry about that. I was on mute. Member Shrimp. Uh, I was Member Shrimp. I approve or agree. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Motion passes. We'll move on to item A5, Council Liaison Report. Okay. Hi, everyone. Yes. Happy spring to come. <laughs> um, going on at the council level is March is budget season. This year it's moving much slower than prior years, but we'll have three days of hearings before the month's out. <laughs> yeah, budget is just really a big deal. It's not reviewing the manager's performance because the manager is the chief executive who runs the day-to-day -day operations of the city are the two most important things that the council does in addition to constituent work, you know, obviously, but we do that individually. So it's a busy month. Um, the council kind of off budget approved the last um, second half of the federal rescue <laughs> last week. There are some good things in there for Ward 1, the long, um, you know, needed project over the Idlewild ponds is going to um, happen. So that's a good thing. Those ponds had a lot of uh, leakage and completely dried out at one point. And they're just a nice amenity in that park. I think they were originally done during the Conservation Corps and the Great Recession Works Program. So that's good. Um, I think there was a million dollars for the Lear. We talked about outdoor uh, landscaping and fencing, but you know, there was discussion at the council table, hey, we need a plan for the Lear, programming and need and so on. So those award one um, issues coming forward um, that have, uh, you know, happened at the council level. The council also last week heard an appeal on that Riviera uh, issue, and we denied it. Um, and I made the motion because it's the, under the council rules, the um, board representative usually makes the motion, and I did make it for denial. I barely, very narrowly focused it on the height of those buildings, which it was unclear, both by the materials that were submitted that probably were not as clear as they should have been, and planning staff probably should not let unclear documents in, but also planning staff wasn't able to really explain the height of the building and how to define height. And so with that, I made a motion to deny, but I think the others came along on other reasons that I probably would not have supported. They were less um, quantitative. And when you turn down a tentative map, which is the subdivision of land, you have to be very quantitative. Um, so uh, I think this development application, it's, and the Riviera was over here off of Idlewild, um, has another path forward. And, um, you know, it'll be up to the neighbors to look at that building permit and see how they measure height, make sure staff has a clear understanding. I was willing to do a continuance, but no one wanted a continuance, the applicant or others. Um, so uh, it just moved forward. But, you know, I still have outstanding questions how the code is being interpreted and you know, it's, it wasn't clear. And I, you know, I started as a planner in that department in 1998 and, you know, to just not be able to answer a baseline question shows to me some gaps. And, you know, when you're up with the council making a decision, you know, you just, you got to have baseline code interpretations ready and they weren't. So that was, that was challenging, but, um, you know, I think it's going to move forward in a different path. So the start of the year has really been about the weather you know, response and so on. Um, and uh, at all, you know, aspects in the ward. The ward is doing relatively well. I got a call 
or an email first thing Friday morning from Aquila, which is off of um, Plum Lane, where we had devastating impacts in 17 and we put in some infrastructure and it held to some degree and did what it was supposed to do, but there was a lot of water coming down that drainage. And so, you know, that drainage, which I can't recall chasing it up, if it's, you know, goes as far as one of the Rosewoods, but it is a very intense drainage. It's the one that drains um, Aquila to Marthium and up in there eventually. Um, but, uh, or actually, no, it's, it's on this side of, um, it goes up, it goes up to the ditch, obviously, but it goes up to, um, Susaline and up there. So it was raging when it came down through Andromeda and, um, and Aquila, but it, it carried all the way to Plum. So that was good. The North Valleys, cause I did drive through there on Friday, Saturday. Um, is really facing some channel challenges. All these challenges are well known. They're well documented because they come up in a lot of the growth and development issues that have come up to the council. And um, and those terminal lakes are just, you know, they do what they do. They, they swell and they shrink. And you just don't have any parallels in this Western United States of building up to them, you know? We know Owens Lake was drained. We know Mona Lake was saved. We know the Salt Lake is having its issues. But these tiny little ones with this much growth around it, there are not examples of terminal lakes with this much growth around them, and they are swelling. And not only that, Swan also has effluent jumping into it. And I've been very consistent since 17 that we need a developed moratorium. The council didn't go with my moratorium uh, resolution years ago and continued growth. Um, and that area is it is is not at a problematic spot right now, um, but I think there's other issues related to some of these large detention facilities that are privately owned. I mean, some of these are as big as you would love a swimming pool that big in your own yard, and it's Chewy's Warehouse or Amazon Warehouse, and you just really know what wonder how they're going to maintain those over you know over the long run. I mean, we really have to have a good inspection program on that. But the, the 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 scary one over the weekend, the really frightening one, and I'm going out there tomorrow, has been bird eye. And, um, you know, there's a lot of finger pointing. It's the city, it's the county. No, it's the city um, that associated with some of the development on the, on the north south side of 80 is, you know, the land is graded and it's just coming into some unincorporated residences. And it's uh, there's staff's been out there working on ice dams and trying to get those, but there's sheet flowing into how homes and neighborhoods. So it's going to be, you know, we'll see what the next couple weeks bring. Um, but on top of that, hopefully, you know, we're okay on snow removal, but then we're going to look to see, you know, what kind of condition our roads are in and et cetera. So that's that. Um, Want to answer, are you Gail? Yes. Yeah. And, um, you know, I want to say apologies. I think um, the city manager is not allowing the resources to go to the neighborhoods right now in information because the stormwater utility, you know, discussion, and I'm getting emails a couple of week on it. Want what's going on? Where is it at? You know, it's under the rule the review of the business impact statement. I have my own questions. He's not making staff available to me to help answer the press coming my way. You would ask to have that update. I was hoping it would be, you know, informative, at least in this forum for me. Um, but right before we set agenda, he made them unavailable, um, you know, supposedly because, according to Tyler, because, um, you know, the flooding going on right now. So, you know. All okay. the administrative people out there clearing ditches. Yeah, 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 that's what I thought. So under your point of he's out there in his way. Yeah, screen. and so I'm going to be developing my own narrative on the stormwater utility, which is essentially, um, I don't think it puts it internal to the city. I don't see any leadership from the electeds. I don't see the city mm -hmm. manager behind it. I know we hired people to work on it, but, and it's sad because it's a real miss for the city. And the, a lot of the people who don't want the fee, they're getting they're getting hosed on their sewer rates. Can do you yeah. want to discuss that well, now or yeah, we have to wait. To we have to wait. Yeah. But also um Gail had reached out to me and some other folks on the on the Barbara Bennett work 
um, which is kind of being in concert with the RTC Arlington Avenue Bridge project, which I understand is under design. And he did not make available the park staff to meet with us the other day either. And that was unfortunate. And I'm, I, uh, you know, know what I know, but park staff needs to be there. So I'm asking the parks commission to discuss this soon, but you got to cool a little bit because it's, it's moving on a path and we're not at that top yet, you know, but I do want to let you know that um, everyone knows Arlington Avenue is bridge is getting done. We're very fortunate because RTC is a very, um, not the most accountable body. They only have five elected officials on there for the whole region. Two of them are county commissioners and two are city council members. Currently the mayor and the at-large members serve from the city, but Alexis Hill, who is our county commissioner, is on the RTC board and she's focusing the Arlington Avenue bridge work. And this has her attention. She was gonna come to the meeting, um, but I advocated when we were gonna do the Arlington Avenue bridge work because the park, both Wingfield and Barbara Bennett were gonna be put up out of commission that we take a look at Wingfield, you know, because Wingfield's looking really old um, with the amphitheater and so, and then staff said, well, let's do Barbara Bennett. And that is, that work is separate or apart from all the access issues that RTC has stood up and I will give them credit on this, uh, a, a stakeholders group. I appointed, asked uh, my predecessor on the council, Tony Harsh and um, Honor Jones, um, to there, they've been sitting on those that committee doing a good job. So, um, so you know they have been doing, and then they've also talked to folks in the vicinity, you know, who have the access issues. So that's part. The parks one is under a quote master plan of sorts, um, and with Barbara Bennett, I'm not so sure what's going on because you know we have we just redid the playground. We have we did the tennis courts. We know we have basketball. There's not a lot of work to be done there. Um, we are doing some new bathrooms in different places, and we um, so it was more Wingfield that was coming forward. But at the right time, um, you know, they may have to go to some meetings and ask other people to put it on the agenda or reach out directly to a new the new parks director when that person comes on. Tyler, have we? Um, I know the park. You know that we have a new parks director coming on. Has an email come to the council on that yet? No. Okay, but uh, uh, when does that person start? I'm not sure, but I can look into it. Yeah, you're you're on the parks commission, right? End of March, isn't it? Yeah. No, I haven't heard an exact date. Okay, but you've been informed that there's a new parks director. Yeah, so you're also, you know, we're at a point. We'll give them a little bit of the of the doubt. So that's that one, and I'm trying to think. Oh, and then you know, the legislature's in session today. The city's charter bill was heard, and uh, Bill and Margo testified, a bunch of other people. Um, and so, you know, that's also got a little bit of, not a whole lot of my attention, but a little bit of my uh, the attention going on. And then I'm very sad with the fire. The manager did not make the fire department available to go over these numbers, but I did ask some questions because since we last met, there was a high rise response on the circus circus, which brings in questions of, you know, Riverside Drive responses to high rise. There was a response to, the El Cortez, there was a fire in the El Cortez where I understand displaced persons were kept overnight on a bus or during night on the bus. And then there was, um, I think 15 people displaced out of 2500 Dickerson Road, which is one of those large complexes. I think it's the apartment one, summer townhomes over there. Um, so there's been a lot of fire activity, but unfortunately we didn't um, get the fire department, did not make themselves available tonight. So in summary, I feel like some of the neighborhood issues, a, lot, a fair amount of the neighborhood issues just aren't germinating up. Um, uh, you know, obviously they are emergency responses because when I called about the Aquila flooding by, you know, 8.30, 8 a.m. on um, Friday, and then I went up there at 11 o'clock, there were two staff members there with shovels and brushes. So, you know, that, that's going on, but it's not an excuse. Um, did you hear anything more about the 2500 Dickerson Road and how many people are displaced? No, I put a call into the American Red Cross okay. and used them to get a contact. Okay. But right. I forwarded your questions to the fire department and they, okay. they will 
send back a response. Okay, we'll get that to you all. I just want everyone to know that, um, I mean, I've been around fire behavior. I got my red card when I was worked in the park service when I was in my twenties. So fire is really important to me, but increasingly as the years have gone, gone by, I am seeing, I don't know if it's just because I'm more, more aware of the older housing stock in the area that I represent, but I'm see, oh, and then we have one on Orange Lane too. Um, a lot of fi household fire activity in Ward One, and I just do not know what the disconnect is. I feel like in Reno we've all been wildfire, but we're seeing a lot of household structure fires, and a, and I'm trying to create a, a very good line with the Red Cross, maybe even send them discretionary money of mine to house households in need. You know. The moment they get out because the scenario i understand is if you're a tenant and your house you know goes on you know and you can't live there that night you have no back support you know you have no back support now when condos burn down and it's owner occupied they probably have they probably have um you know insurance on the back end and some of those houses not all, but probably have more resources. But if a tenant even is carrying renter's insurance and there's a fire, you know, they may be five nights out of pocket on motel charges if they don't have a household they can go to. And so I'm really trying to keep track of um, household fires, you know, um, uh, officer involved shootings, um, homicides, um, homeless folks who are dying in Ward One and um, pedestrian crashes and fatalities, street fatalities and major crashes have always been like these benchmarks that I look at, but increasingly I'm looking at fire displacement. So, and seeing, you know, I, I do think, I did track it as much my early years, but I am thinking that we're seeing a fair amount and that's why I was kind of disappointed the fire department uh, doesn't seem to have these metrics very well. But they just really seem to do more calls for service. So anyway, do you have any questions for me? Anyway, yeah, Jerry. Go back uh, to the disbursement of funds. Mm -hmm. uh, um, there was requests in there for additional recreational fields. Were they funded? They were. They were. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. And and given since you said <laughs> uh, March is budget month, uh, given your experience in that type of thing, what's the base? Best way for folks to lobby the city on budget items. You know, you really need to understand the budget to to lobby the city on the budget. <laughs> uh, so sit in on the presentations because if someone comes and talks about you know one thing and it's like you're e so easily discounted if you don't understand the budget, which is like. Well, you're talking about the sewer fund and we're talking about the general obligation fund, or you're talking about money, federal money, and we're only talking about property tax. So you really do need to have an understanding. A lot of cities that that want to be very open, transparent, and participatory do budgeting completely different. It's like participatory budgeting. You know, meetings all over the ward on the budget, understanding that baseline education and our finance department just hasn't gone over the hump to be able to do that. They can spend time setting, standing up special assessment districts for people like Stonegate and then pull them back, but they can't go out and educate the public, haven't been directed by the council to educate the public on the budget. So listen to those first three budget hearings, read, read the finance department, understand what's going, how our budget works. And then, you know, I'm happy to talk to anyone, even if it's not a Ward 1 need, about, um, you know, how to present a budget concept to the council. Because I do feel we have such a gap in letting the public um, into that black box work. And frankly, you know, the council's kind of not even really as engaged. And we have three new council members who have never sat through budget before. It's a learning curve. Okay, last last one. Uh, in the legislative update you you had, uh, what was the feedback so far on the ward six bill? Well, it's no feedback. It's just um, my perception, and it just happened an hour ago. You probably Bill was in Carson testifying in person, so he's just driving up right now, right? Did you mm -hmm. just go straight up? Yep. So you know. 
that's how fresh it is. But there was a lot of opposition. A lot of people do not want to turn back the clock to that at-large representative. They want a sixth ward. It was presented that we would be doing redistricting. We should be redistricting right now, particularly because people want to want to throw their hat in the ring for a council seat and they don't know how the math is going to change. So that's going on right now. Um, but I think the bill, you know, will live with the legislative session till July. And that's not fair because people need that certainty. So anyway, um, you know, we'll see that, that process. There's so much going on, Carson. I, you know, I don't know. You were one of what? 14 people have spoken opposition? Yeah, there was at least a dozen or so people that spoke in opposition and one person neutral and nobody in support of. I, I looked at the online voting or comments and it was running like 10 to 1 uh, yeah. against. Uh, yeah. Against. Yeah. The, uh, it was in Colorado, most of the objections had to do with um, Changing existing law, there's no good reason to do so. And hey, we did this redistricting thing one in Q4 2021, but then a few months later, somebody wants to do their job. You know, so uh, but that it was it was interesting. One of the folks who presented was a formal former city council person and a member of this group. And so there was there's a lot of people that the the legislative committee really listened to other than yeah. a little me who didn't always talk to them. <laughs> it was very citizen driven. There were a few groups, but it was very citizen driven. And um, we'll see. I, I want to also follow up on that. But first, a comment on the Barbara Bennett yeah. part. Um, my recollection is we had a presentation and uh, about Barbara Bennett and they were talking about putting out a survey. Of, uh, a survey. Yes. And that's what got everybody's attention, but there's not been a survey. That's right. So just word to the wise, next time they say they're going to put out a survey, they ought to put out a survey. Yeah. Yeah. And maybe even before they come and talk to us about what it is. Yeah. They're doing. Yeah. Tyler, let's let's find that out because um, you know, maybe find the minutes, take it to whoever, you know, and say, you know. This, you know, come on, come on. Uh, yeah. But on the on the uh, on this legislative thing, uh, I'm very fuzzy on whose idea it was and how what the process was, even to put together this bill. Who decided? Yeah, I mean, in the city, yeah, it it yeah. seems to have come out of nowhere and gotten yeah. somebody that are here. Yeah, yeah, and I think um, there's a there's a Substack newsletter written by a group called um, Biggest Little Streets, and yeah. someone told me you can read one of the chart. They interviewed one of the charter members, and that person had you know front front row and had their own opinion. And then Nevada Independent did an article on it today too. But I would read that if you want some background reporting, read the Nevada Independent and this biggest little city. I read the biggest little city and then uh and then uh what's her name also has a substack. Oh uh Alicia yeah uh Barber. Yes yeah Barber Barber. Yeah, Barber. yeah yeah a few yeah. things but but I haven't been clear somebody in yeah. the city yeah. also said, yeah. said, you know what, I think I'd rather keep things the way they are and seek legislation to reverse what we've been planning to do. Someone had it, to decide that. It did go through the property channels. Now, were those, should those channels been augmented by, you know, this was really Bill's point, especially since we just went out and redistricted and told everyone it was coming. But the channels were that the city count the city gets two laws to propose as their laws to the legislature. The city council voted to bring this forward. It was a six-one vote. I said no, six members said yes. Unfortunately, well, fortunately, fact is three of those are no people are no longer in the city council. So you got three people currently on the city council who supported this, but that's the timeline. They had to get it down there. So they took it on recommendation from this charter committee that met during 2022, seven or eight times, that on a split vote at different times did recommend it. So it did go through the proper um, channel. It really did. It really did. But um, 
So, but uh, yeah. But somebody woke up one day and said, you know what? And you know what? It was interesting when I was looking into it. You look at all the activity that happened in 2021 redistricting mm -hmm. activity. In the first presentation the city gave, that was it's still fourth quarter. I don't remember the dates off the top of my head, but in the first presentation the city gave, second slide of the presentation said, Oh, here's this word six thing. That's later. That's not today. We're going to talk about it today, but it's coming. And then that was the game for the next two meetings. Mm -hmm. So I think reading between the lines, I don't know, but when the charter committee, when they make came up, one of the folks who testified today was the previous chairman of the charter committee. And he put some additional color around it. And he said that when the charter committee moved this forward, I think five of the people weren't there. They barely had quorum and it passed on a H3 vote. Yeah. So it was, it was, yeah. it, it, it wasn't, like Jimmy said, they didn't do anything Wrong, but there sure are so many more ways to do it well. Yeah. The yeah, mayor are interested in process in, in some respect. I'm yeah. actually on a legislative action committee and I'm going to Carson on Wednesday, so it will be my first time there my first time doing too. that. But, but <laughs> does the city does the city have a lobbyist? Yes, we do. We have a staff lobbyist. Um I've been pretty ardent that we don't hire lobbyists because when they did the Tesla legislative, the Tesla breaks, our hired lobbyist was also Tesla's lobbyist. <laughs> it seemed like our interest got. So a lot of, you know, so hiring a lobbyist who has all these other clients is really not a good idea because they're not going to stand here for you. Um, and in time they, you know, they might. So we have a staff members down there pretty much every day. But, and we also join with other large cities to kind of have an agenda. The mayors presented the bill today. You can go back on the YouTube and listen to her arguments. Her and Council Member Reese, uh, who is the at large member, have really, and, and they're not hiding it, you know, he had conversations with all the charter members advocating for them, or really the people behind it. And then, you know, it put staff in a little bit of an awkward situation, I think, because, you know, they had to staff the committee, but you got a council member and mayor, you know, saying, we'd like to really have this done. So it is where it is. Um, I think it's sad because I've been, this is my 11th year. We've done, this will be our third charter bill. No city brings their charter bill every other session. And it really airs a lot of division in Reno, you know, and 65% and, and of them are from Vegas or represent some portion of the Clark County. And it's like, what's going on in Reno? I think we have other things to do. So anyway, that's it. That's that. Thank you. Yep, yep. All right, any other questions for Jenny? Uh, maybe. The best person to answer this question is here. Yes, we already went over it. I know, I heard. I'm going to ask anyway, maybe you have some insight. Yeah, and I, I walked down here to check out the river and I forgot my glasses. So On the bottom of the, the fire department report, it says uh, 83 incidents to Rimsa. So I'm curious how many of those people had to pay the bill to the city for that kind of mass response. Yeah, I. And, and, I opposed this arrangement um, because I did not know that we would be billing actually our citizens. So you now have a fire department that is billing its citizens. And that is a concern for me because um, fire service is something you think of, you know, I call a firefighter, they come and take care of me. And now that we've stood up transport, you know, at the very, it really wasn't disclosed, and I had to pull it out during hearing, but if you're an uninsured patient and rents a, and the city transports you, you're going to get a bill. And I do not think that that um, was something that, um, you know, was represented to the public or that anyone really knows. People are accustomed to maybe getting a bill from REMSA, which is a franchisee to the city. But now you've got the city doing a fee for service, and I'm going to be looking at this during budget to see what those fees are. Thank you. Can, can we explain a little bit more about the fees for service? It was Saturday, I was woken up by nine fire engines that support vehicles. 
wonder who's going to play for that one. <laughs> well, I mean, that's the question is, in theory, you know, according to the protocols, I understand is, you know, REMS is the, I know this, REMS is the fire, the, the emergency response for medical. But if they are otherwise occupied, it's not at this high level for them. Reno now has ambulances and will do transports. Okay. So that's why I think Bill's asking of the 83 incidents, it is a good question. How many were someone like this person? It, it was a you, it was in your neighborhood, right? Yeah, it was the alley right across from my apartment. They yeah. had five engines, literally the, the ladder truck pulled down the alley, not one of the other four on a yeah. side street. They were converging. Yeah, yeah. And I don't know, you know, sometimes an allergy of fire hose issues. But if it, if it, ambulances came, you know, maybe Reno calls off Ramza, so it's Reno's. If they did a transport, chances are that person will get a bill or their insurance company will get a beer, bill and the, the, um, on behalf of the city of Reno. So, okay. so there's an incentive to send more they, no, they, they're not charging for the ladder truck. They're not charging for others, but they're charging only for the transport. But are they charging for the paramedics? <laughs> you know, I really, I really, need, and I appreciate you guys bring this up because I'm going to absolutely bring this up during budget because it came in last minute on this, uh, this protocol that the council did as an agreement with Renza. So I'm going to budget, Tyler, mm -hmm. remember these. He's been trained. This is his first year doing budget with me. So he's been trained to help be my second set of um, memories for budget issues. <laughs> oh, and we are going on our tour. Um, is it this Friday? Yes, it's this Friday. Yeah, but yeah. I, I'm i going to Bird Eye tomorrow. I think we're going to do a little bit of tour. Um, of uh, Ward 4 North. And then where else were we going? Uh, I think we're going to the Amtrak building. Oh, we're going to the Amtrak building. But if anyone anywhere has anything that they think they'd like me to see in Ward 1, um, I'll go this uh, Friday with Tyler. So just let Tyler or I know. So okay. anyway, thank you, Mr. Chair. All right, thanks. We're going to move on to item A6, staff liaison. Hi, everyone. Tyler Shaw for the record, community liaison for Ward 1. Um, I have a few quick updates for you all. The next Ward 1 Neighborhood Advisory Board meeting will be on April 10th, and it'll be here at McKinley Arts and Culture Center at 5.30 p.m. Um, at that meeting, RPD is scheduled to come and give their quarterly updates, so keep an eye out for that on the agenda. Um, and then my only other announcement, the Senior Citizen Advisory Committee has put out a call for senior artists, and they're looking for seniors to participate in the annual senior artist exhibit and show, which will be here at McKinley. Um, so if anyone's interested, the drop-off dates for the art are April 17th, 18th, and 19th, and the show will run from April 25th through June 2nd. Those are my updates, Mr. Chair. All right. Thank you. Move on to item B2, presentation by the City of Reno planning staff on the process and procedures for development projects that require a public notice. Yeah. Hi, everyone. My name is Grace Macklin. I'm a senior management analyst with planning um, and development services. So we've been getting a couple of questions, mostly from new NAV members of what the development process is, um, why we only see certain applications, and why meeting dates change. So um, I really welcome how we'll do a presentation on super high level of what the development process looks like, um, and then you know what you see versus what you don't see. Go back to the. Oh, that's the first slide. Oh, no, this is the first slide. Okay. So, high level, how does development work? So, you had a local restaurant that requires a piece of land. And what does the process look like to actually develop that restaurant? Um, so, the first step is to find out if what they want to build is permitted in that on that piece of property. So, if it's permitted, they have to look at the site. They have to see what site constraints they have. Is there a drainage way on site? Are there significant slopes? Um, what, you know, what's adjacent to them? Is there residential nearby? Things of that nature. 
Um, and then they have to reach out to see how they can design this building. So how tall can it be? How far back can it be? Um, where can we build on this site and what uses are permitted? And then once the site is graded and the building is being built, then the applicant would apply for a business license. So this is when we would look at the, the use specifically um, and see if that they can approve that business license. So development services is involved in kind of every step of this process. And depending on what is allowed and what's not allowed, they would go through the appropriate channels at that point. Next slide, please. So going back to the use and what's allowed on certain sites. So our code's about 600 pages long, but about 20 pages are dedicated to use specific standards um, and this table of uses. And so anything that's any use uh, ranging from residential to restaurants to industrial um, is in this table. So we would look at their zone and we would look at their use they're proposing. And we would see if it's allowed in that district. And so this is kind of where we get a uh, C in that table. It says that it, they have to go through a conditional use permit. So these are some of the things that you guys have seen. Um, a P though means it's permitted by right. So for reference, we process about 10,000 building permits a year. And so those are just projects that are permitted by right. Um, single family residential homes often are permitted by right. And then some of these projects will go straight to city council. So annexations, abandonments, those are more high level policy issues. Um, you guys will also see these projects, but they don't go to planning commission for approval. Next slide, please. So going back to kind of what the NAV will see. So NAVs do not review building permits and they do not review uh, administrative reviews. You know, these are 30 day discretionary reviews where staff can still place conditions and they're still publicly noticed. So I'm sure you guys have seen those yellow postcards in the mail and the yellow signs on sites. Those will also be for um, staff reviews and there's, it's a 30 day process. So they don't really have a ton of time to come to these NAVs. Um, but so the building permits, administrative reviews are the only two things that the NAVs will not review. And then sometimes it'll come to the NAV and they'll get a ton of the feedback and the project will change. So they'll you know, put in some more trees or more parking. Um, so we, we change kind of the dates or push back that planning commission date so that the developer can really get it right. So that sometimes you'll see those meeting dates change. We try to be super transparent. If we if it changes after a legal notice is sent out, we do resend out these notices. Next slide. So this is kind of an example of what those public notices look like. We send out a courtesy notice, and this is where all of the dates are going to be tentative. And then we send out that legal notice where everything has to be correct. Otherwise, we have to resend out these notices. Um, that courtesy notice is subject to change. So sometimes, like I said, things change. The developer has to put in more trees or based on feedback, they're trying to make sure that this development goes through smoothly. So there is some um, links that I'll show you, tell you guys about where you can stay up to date um, on these meeting dates. Slide, please. And so, like I said, meeting days change. Um, the, after these legal notices get sent out, though, they're, they're, they're not subject to change. You can see all meeting agendas are posted online. Um, and I'm happy to share these links with you guys as well. Next so we also have a resource on our website to sign up to receive all newsletters. Um, happy to share these links with you, but this is kind of how you can get the most up-to-date information instead of just waiting for these postcards to come in your mail. And in, in case you know you don't get notice, we will notice everyone within 750 feet minimum of a project. Um, but that might not hit your home; it might be in a different ward. So this is probably the best way to stay up to date on all projects in the city. And I think that's it. Great questions. Uh, thank you for being here. Appreciate it. It's late in the day, so thank you. Um, how often do you see projects come before you that go to a NAB, get some input, and then change? How often does that actually happen? It, it really depends. I mean, I can't even put a percentage on that just because obviously the bigger projects where you have a large um, multi family project um, is going to change a little bit more than maybe 
so of some other talk trying to get their liquor license down the road. That's that can't change, you know. There, there's no development code for that. So I, I do think that it also depends on the um, developer, unfortunately. So the development and the developer. But I do know that when staff receives these NAB comments and they're all about parking, we are going to make sure that we try to address that in the staff report. And if the developer um, can, they'll, they'll try to resituate the site to make sure that those needs are addressed. So I guess, and if you get comments from a member of the NAB, um, how do you know it's from a member of the NAB? So it's the same public comment form, um, but it does differentiate between a NAB member and a public commenter. Um, so we put them actually in separate folders. And then when we write our staff report, we have public comment versus NAB comment. Um, it's all public comment, but we do differentiate between those NAB members and the commenters. That's helpful. Thank you. So I guess part of the question that's always been is how much do the NABs weigh or how much do they give? Back to what you guys are looking at overall. So we say, you know, we fill out public comment forms. We have people come in here, do public comment. It's on the record. But how much is that is taken into the planning commission? And how much do they hear all of this? Or do does everybody need to go repeat it? That, what we're looking for is how much weight do we have? Is it worth even having the NABs? Is it do we provide any benefit towards this plan? Yes. I think so, for sure. Um, one, because it's so early in the process. So um, sometimes it's tough because you only get public comment at planning commission. And at that point, it's too late to, to, to really um, make any substantial changes. But at this NAB, I do think that it gives more of an opportunity to take in, you know, if I had a development project here tonight, I would hear your comments tomorrow. I would sit down at my desk and go through what are the common concerns um, and see if there is a trend. And then I would forward those all you know, planning commissioners get all of those comments. Um, I do think that there is a lot of weight held in the NAB's comments because you guys see these and are more, um, you have a better trained eye than, than you know, maybe someone else is, that's providing public comments. You're seeing these development applications over and over again. You're a little bit more well-versed with, you know, how we do things. Uh, and I do know I've, I've had comments from planning commissioners in the past of, um, We've had you know people combine public comment and NAB comments, and they have said we would really like you to separate these because we want to see the NAB comments um, on their own. We want to know what the NAB talked about. So it, it does come up in conversation of well, why did the NAB members have these comments and questions? Did these get addressed? Did the NAB feel comfortable with this project and back? I mean, sometimes you see projects two or three times, not very often, but occasionally. So that'll get addressed. If planning commission or they'll ask about the NABs. Comments. So you said you look for a common theme, right? So mm -hmm. you're looking at all these as a common theme. If you have a neighbor, a neighbor that backs the property and they have a real concern about their privacy or whatever it's going to be, or they just don't want to build there, how much weight does that does that get carried over to the community <laughs> and other comments as equal, or are you thinning these things? Out? So you're saying is that held as much weight as maybe the uh, members comments? Right. I'm just saying is that these are all the comments <laughs> for the planning commission yes. and the overall. Yes. So any comment we receive is definitely given to the planning commission. I, like I said, I do think that the NAB comments do hold a lot of weight because you guys see these projects so often. However, I mean, I've had cases where there is that rear neighbor is going to be the main person impacted by this development. That also holds a lot of weight because they're the ones that are going to be living with this development day in day out. So um, it's obviously you can't put a hierarchy on it, but I, I generally I think the NABs uh, members comments hold a lot of weight, and then you know any other person who would be directly impacted from development obviously is going to hold a lot of weight. I don't know if that answers you. Because we've always sat here and go, yeah, fill out the forum where you, what do we do? Where people are here, they're really up in arms, and we say go to the planning commission or fill out this form. Then where does that form go, right? Right. So now we and I will say I look forward to the maybe this is like a nerd thing to say, but I look forward to the day after NAPS because sometimes it's it's just exciting to see, okay, I have all these people who are really concerned about something. We have something to move with and 
um, you know, landscaping or they're concerned about this 24 hour use. And like, that's something to give me to say, it's not just me who's concerned about this. It's, it's these community members. So if nobody ever commented, it looks like, you know, staff is coming up with this stuff out of thin air. So it really, really helps to have these people who are directly living with this are concerned about this. It's more eyes on the project than just the city who's not in the, they're outside looking in. And totally. And you guys live in the community. I mean, I live in the community, obviously, too, but you guys live in the communities where this development is happening. And so it, it's just really helpful to get that firsthand experience and firsthand comments on a project. Thanks. Anybody else? Just a problem. Yeah. I'm curious when, when the city puts out a request for proposals, where do those go first? That's going to be separate from the development services department. So um, I think uh, it just depends on what the request for proposal is, it would mandate which department it will go to. That makes sense. So, like for um, that Riverside, was it Riverside project? Mm -hmm. I believe that was out of our um, uh, manager of economic development. That's his title. Revitalization. Revitalization manager, sorry. <laughs> um, so that, that wasn't through the development services department. So I think it depends on what that request is for. All right, other questions? Would anyone on Zoom like to ask a question? Any NAB members, go ahead and ask. No. All right. Thank you for your time. Thank you guys. If you have any questions, um, feel free to reach out to me or the department. Sorry, what was your last name? Mackinan, M-A-C-K-E-D-O. Thank you. Yes, of course. We're gonna move on to item B3, City of Reno's stormwater utility presentation and discussion. Oh, is it on the agenda? Oh, but it was, it was not available. Yeah, so it was on the agenda with staff. Um, we changed the agenda due to their availability, so it's on the agenda, but you're presenting. Um, so oh, that's right. Okay, I'm yeah. sorry, Tyler. It's okay. You're right. Yeah. Do you have your PowerPoint? <laughs> I mentioned it right now. You know, a lot of good questions are coming in. I have a lot of questions. I am very This was a really big rock priority for me. It was even on my radar before 17 and 18. Um, and, you know, to all those who are saying, you know, I think it's wrong, wrong, wrong. Well, guess what? You're paying for it anyway, out of your sewer funds, fees, and your sewer rates have been going up by CPI since 2014. Now, the development community and those who want to hook up new to the sewer, guess where their rates have been? They've been in last since 2014. So rate payers, not those who represent new growth, are paying for the sewer system and whenever there's storm water, they use it, they go, they tap it out of the sewer fund. And so, you know, that inequity, the council thankfully just decided to get rid of. And they are going forward and right sizing the connection fees and putting them on a CPI consumer price index, just like the rates. So now there's a little more equity in the, in the sewer fund, which as I said, pays for stormwater uh, going forward. You lost a decade, growth got a free ride for a decade, new rate payer did not. So that's good. And just as an aside, it was a hard pill for me to swallow to even put the hookups on a CPI, because I don't believe that rates should go on automatic escalators. I think accountable elected officials should have to you know, come together, talk to the engineers, what are the capital needs, and do rate setting, you know, more or less like talk about as in five-year increments, balanced up to capital needs. If you put it on a floater, automatic, 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 there's no accountability. It's just going to fly. And I feel very strongly about that on rate setting. But I had to take the vote to finally, because the council was finally going to stick it to you know, the growth side of the sewer fund versus just the rate payers. And I figured there's parity, at least in that. 
So now come to the stormwater. You know, when the work first came forward, it was like, well, the stormwater can put its own rate setting, and there's a way to make it much more equitable. You read publications about how to run a government equitably, having stormwater utility is one of those challenges because residential represents a lot less impact to the storm runoff in a community than the rain precipitation you get than you know, a shopping center parking lot, or certainly in this town that's become a logistics center, a logistics center. So done right, that stormwater utility would give a little bit of a breather to the um, rate payers, you know, the sewer rate payers, and make big business pay their own fair share. Now, is it coming to the council like that? Has big business gotten uh you know the design of the rates you know as they come before the council <laughs> i'm starting to see signs of it um and i think some of the early conclusions that i believe should hold true if you were really focused on equity um would be that once you stand up the storm utility you could and should back off on the sewer rate increases, automatic rate increases. Now the sewer automatic rate increases, you know, as I said, they're just a bad way to do rates anyway, <laughs> you know? So, you know, bad way, but, you know, secondly, I think there would be a way once you stand up the stormwater to say, we're gonna get rid of, um, you know, the escalator on the sewer. And, you know, so in a perfect world, and I probably will start to come to do this because I'm not getting any help from any staff on this, is I'm gonna, I'm gonna throw down the gauntlet on what a good stormwater utility looks like. And I'm not sure, maybe it's the one that's out there right now, but I'm not entirely sure those parameters are there. I don't think the leadership and the will is there on the, count, on the rest of the body either. Um, the mayor really needs to step on up on this. Um, uh, it, you know, because she has the force of the office, but um, I'm not seeing a lot of signs there that it is, you know, moving favorably and staff isn't dragging their feet on it because, uh, uh, you know, it's lost a lot of momentum and that's un unfortunate. But to reiterate, um, it, you know, I mean, Verdi to West Plum Lane to North Valley's Reno needs a stormwater utility. It is a way for very equitable um, cost distribution when you blend it in with, you know, the inequities in the sewer fund, if you can get to those. Um, and we just, you know, we should get there, but I'm not entirely sure that we're we're going to get there. And that, that would be unfortunate. We don't. Um, and I'm trying to think if there's any, there was one other concept in there, but I don't know if anyone has any questions for me. Yeah. No. Huh? <laughs> yeah. Well, for one thing, they raised the typical homeowner rate from 850 to 1350 from one year to the next, from 21 to 22. There was never what's the rationale for that? Yeah. And and how do you come and ask a homeowner to pay 150 bucks more a year and you don't even provide a list of project priorities? Yeah. Well, they supposedly did go through all the capital needs and have a big number there. I don't know how this why, why was that never tied to their PR program? Well, I did pull up the CIP, you know, a general CIP. I'll tell you one thing is the non-residential folks, like the big wall, you know, the big warehouse distributions, a million square feet of runoff in a, uh, in a, you know, whether it's in the floodplain along the Karen, like Dermody, you know, has one on the floodplain on University Farms or up North Virginia, where it's in the Swan Lake Hydro Basin, you know, and they've got these swimming size uh, pool uh, retention dams. They want credit, the, the one they've been floating credits. They, and Bill wrote me a nice letter about this. They, they want credits for what they've done. It's like, sorry, you're on the side of a big mountain. You're in the floodplain. You don't get credits for what you've done. Come and look at my little lawn or my little drain. No, no. And a three-year ramp up. Yeah, and a three-year ramp. Three ramp up. So that they, you know, so the tentacles are going to make this very untenable to the whole supposition, you know, presupposition of it, which was equity. We should talk about some of the impacts too on some of the different land uses. 
Uh, it's that, that's 600K a year from Washoe County Schools. So that, that's equivalent to 10 to 15 teacher position. That's how much it's going to cost. Yeah. Yeah. And what about churches? I don't even see. They got humongous parking lots. Uh, they don't even, are they considered in, uh, commercial, industrial? No. What are they considered? I think all that was in the materials. I, I think there was a base down, step down for uh, government. They, well, it talks, it talks about schools. Uh, yeah. And some of the guidance fairly specific. Yeah. And it gives the schools a little bit of an out if they do an education program. Yeah. But they have so many facilities that, yeah. that that is not going to exclude. And if, if we talk about the credit program, like yeah. why, not, why are we giving credits to commercial industrial land uses that are required to put this in in the first place? Yeah, it's a standard of development, I know. And that little notion, I think, right there is maybe making this thing start to fall apart. In addition to the general skepticism of new fees or taxes, you know, that anyone is going to have a, a bias against, unless, you know, they're looking at the ditch about ready to come down on their yeah, house, well, I, which there are people who are having that situation. I mean, I, I can see that, uh, you know, all, most of the new money is going to go for concrete and pipes. That makes sense. But if you're going to have a real credit program where you're going to give land use as a major break, it seems to me that you have to provide multiple community benefits in order to do that. For example, water supply. Supposing there are certain areas and every, well, there are certain areas where uh, groundwater recharge would play a bigger role uh, in detention, that type of thing. Uh, another thing would be recreation, for example, using stormwater detention basins for fields. There's a tremendous shortage of recreational space, active recreational space. The other thing is, is just really trying to promote more open space. So it, it seems to me that so many of these land uses, well, they're already built. If they, if they have stormwater detention or pollutant removal, it's already there. They're going to have to retrofit it. Okay, it would seem to me if you're going to get a credit, that's expensive. And if you could display, in other words, so if I'm a downtown business or someplace and I've got, there's nothing I can really do with my own site, but maybe I own some land up, up uh, um, outside the city or on the fringe of the city. Or maybe I could buy credits somewhere else to put in fields and detention. Yeah. In other words, why can't you have multiple community benefits if you're going to give credits? You know, you are talking about, you know, hitching on to their idea of credits, which complicates the administration of this regulation so much, you know, and then floating, floating, you know, credits and everything. Uh, you know, I've written regulations, I've regulated, there is a real beauty in simplicity and not, you know, one size custom sort of things, you know, and or customized uh, rates. And that's what would happen with a with a, um, a credit program. You know, some some staffer, mid-level staffer would be, oh, I'm going to go look at the 40 acre, you know, Marmot warehouse building. And now I'm going to go look at the 60 acre Mikata warehouse building and their retention dam has a more slow, better build ratio. I mean, it just completely complicates it. Well, it's, it's a nightmare yeah. to basically monitor. Yeah. I, yeah. I can see that. Yeah. But, and it seemed to me the whole credit idea was basically to lessen the fiscal impact on certain land uses yeah. and, and reduce the political uh, blowback. Yeah, and they should just have to stand on their own with the standards, you know, because the houses aren't going to be eligible. Just, you know, have a simple, a simple, you know, structure, not too many classifications. And then if you want to get to these other amenities, you know, groundwater recharge is a different thing because we got a raw water purveyor for that, you know, but you know, recreation by land to, well, you know, like- Then like, there's the threat that a well-funded program looking at piping poses to things like steam, uh, dish and the environmental values of those resources. Well, that's why, you know, you, you gotta set rates in five-year increments, you know, five to seven, and not let the engineers, you know, have forecasts of 
consumer price index. I mean, so the price of oil and you know food and everything else goes up, and the engineers get you know more money to do whatever. They have to every five years over at Toma, you know, they do a really good CIP. So you know the five-year projection of what you have to do on your CIP. And your CIP is capital and maintenance. And on the stormwater utility, there will be property acquisition. The gal who wrote me Friday morning. You know, she wasn't living there in 17, 18, 18, 19. And I wanted the city to put that property so bad because it is a real trouble spot. And there could be a nice, you know, overflow on that property. You know, and I know she loves her house and she's happy, but, you know, it's just your, you know, property acquisition. And look at it. We ended up paying out of the sewer fund for the people the jury told us we flooded in Swan Lake. You know, that was $3 million out of the sewer fund. So we're buying property one way or the other. Anywho, this is my narrative. <laughs> Would you like to tell us how you really feel? <laughs> no, but I am listening. I am listening, and I'm, I'm going to put a lot of attention into it. Um, Has there been any budget? consideration given to the legal ramifications of what's going to inevitably happen to Sparks? Well, you know, so my big question was, why is it Reno taking this on instead of the county so that we can bypass borders and alleviate ourselves of the legal ramifications? Because this has, as soon as it involves the Truckee River, that is going to cost us. It has been shown across this country, multiple areas. Whoever's upstream gets to screw whoever's downstream, and that's where you end up paying in the long run is flooding half of Sparks because you bolstered everything and they didn't have the money. Yeah, but hold off on that because in response to the 1997 flood, and I was not here that yet, I moved in in May of 98, the region did stand up a 1-8 sales tax. I believe it's 1-8 sales tax region-wide for the flood authority, okay? So the mayor sits on the flood authority. We send mem members, there's other members. They have one eight cents sales tax, and that's what was used in part to build the Virginia Bridge. It's what's gonna use in part the transportation money due to Arlington. But a lot of money has gone to Sparks through that one eight. So the main stem in theory has funding. Is it enough, you know? I think we should be building a bridge every decade in Reno specific. And I don't see one coming on within a decade of when we open Virginia. I just don't see all the time. But there is money for the main stem river. Now the stormwater could go in conjunction with it, but the 1-8 sales tax for the, for the river cannot go out to Swan Lake. But Sparks then on top of it, rather than going through the equitable proposition of having a stormwater utility like what we want to do, tax on to their sewer utility, I think seven and a half, a single family, a quarter maybe. I mean, Sparks just threw a stormwater utility onto their sewer bill. So they've done some work and that's why they've done work what's called the uh, North Truckee drain coming down. They, they've really done a mini version of what you know, we say we want to do, but using it through their sewer fund, but we've got so much more, especially with the terminal lakes, you know, those are, so yeah, I mean, I, I need to come up to speed 100% on this. I've had some of these facts and lost, but please do know that there is a dedicated non-expiring regional funding source for the river. Okay. Yeah. Okay. And go go read the Truckee River um, Flood Agency and you know all their enabling you know about us link. You can read about them there. Okay. Yeah. Other question? Um, more of a comment, I guess. The originally it was like, oh my gosh, the seven hundred percent tax increase because that's the way it was. You know, so that's when I read it, like a seven hundred percent tax increase. You better have a good reason for that. Uh, it took a public records process to get some information and. Wouldn't you know somebody with a with a brain actually looked at a lot of this stuff? And I do have it's like a 120-page report that the city sent over to me. And the long and the short of it is, is that somebody smart who knows this stuff pretty well really did take some time and look at it and really thought about it and made some pretty level-headed responses, I think. 
Um, but what's unfortunate about it is that I had to get through public forms requests. Like I, I had to do a FOIA request to get this information, and it took like a month. I actually ended up talking to the guy in the city, and the guy knows what he's doing. He's got a good team behind him. Um, it's not some reckless thing. Um, at this point, the biggest problem with it is we need to reassess every I don't know, two years, five years, whatever. You know, you're like here, you, you know, yeah. it's a blank check. But yeah, it was, it was really reassuring. Like, what the hell? You want 100 or 40 million dollars or whatever for what? You know, and you let like, businesses off the hook. So it helps change my point of view a little bit. But, it would, but, but look what you had to go to to find that they, out. Yeah, that's why I was in Carson today. It's the exact same problem. Yeah, and so that's why, you know, we, we asked to put it on the agenda and staff can't show up. I mean, I just, I really, I, I think that internally, um, whatever's going on, it's not really the strategy, the priority internally in the manager. And the council has not given him the directive. I think it's it's being, you know, it's, it's problematic and I'd like to see it done, but um, done right. So anyway, we'll think, yeah. I, it, it looks good. I'm just, I remember previous floods, the last time it rained on snow and I was out here throwing sandbags. So I'm glad I'm not here today or last week. So yeah, we're it's better. We got a mix. I want to go back to your position. Your position is essentially that uh, it, it should be a, a flat fee based on impervious area, period. Well, no, yeah, impervious area, how they initially in the report analyzed it and no credits coming in for you know and you would how would you treat homeowners then they are i can't remember how it's written it's not fixture based i think they're flat rate but there's some obviously some demarcation on the size of your house or your property right. yeah there is there's a three-tier yeah. system yeah uh, there's uh, based on the amount of impervious area yeah, that your lot yeah so your lot size yeah yeah that and, type of thing. and that's fair that's fair enough you know and then you go into commercial classifications and industrial you say it's yeah. fair enough but basically a shopping center and stuff is totally built out you know and if you look at ward one and in a lot of our home sites and everything we're basically capturing stormwater we're not we're not generating it well you know <laughs> no, I know it, it gets complex. Yeah, yeah. But but it, it also kind of seems that homeowners are, again are kind of having to basically pull the load and uh, just like they are with the sewer fund. Well, you know, I mean, on the other hand, you know, we've got these nineteenth-century water conveyances called the ditch, right? And the ditch companies that had the city come to the table to enter into agreements for maintenance, you know, we're not wrong. You know, the building out of Collin Ranch, the building out of West Plum Lane did involve using these irrigation ditches for stormwater utility, the stormwater utility. So when you say, you know, I've got a nice landscape yard, I'm not increasing any runoff. Yeah, you did when your house was essentially flat pad, you know, and your the street was created, you know, up above the ditch, you know, you, you did. And and the for Ward One, the really important thing is that um, you know, we're gonna get the resources to stabilize these ditches and maybe in some point in time take them from the ditch companies because that concept is actually in the ditch agreements, and the ditch companies are pretty ready to get rid of them anyway um but you know there are, there are some legitimate concerns coming through this process for example down in damani ranch when they set that up they created their own drainage dip, drainage um district so they have their own district they should get a car back how you deal with hoas because i know that some of the hoa fees out of colin do do stormwater utility so Monte ranch well, the money ranch is more formalized you know, uh, as it is. But anyway, um, you know, I, this is probably the most involved conversation, because I don't think any of my other colleagues are having these conversations in their wards, and they should be, you know, but, or I don't like to tell anyone how they do their job, but, you know, 
it's not having a lot of community discussion other than the stakeholder meetings that staff's having and um, open houses. Other questions? Please. Thank you. All right. Yeah. Anybody on the? Maybe we can get staff here next time. Nick, do you have any questions? No questions on my side. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Thank you. We're going to move on to item C, board commission committee member reports and announcements. Hearing none, I'm going to move on to item D, future agenda items. Hearing none, we're going to move on to item E, public comment. Would, would anyone in the room like to give public comment? Yeah. Today? Please. Um, so I live in Long Beach. If you could start, just state your name. You'll have three minutes. Oh, Thank you. Thank you. The one this week. Shoulders. <laughs> so yeah, I have some comments because I live on the beach and Stupo um, Beach. And in 2017, 2018. Um, you can notice all the knives, one water was diverted out of the truck and driven into the ditch. Um, the lawsuit ensued, we won that lawsuit. Um, now it's come forth that the ditch, now, as you just mentioned, wants to be overtaken and used for stormwater harvest, whole deal here. And um, I'm wondering how you first plan on doing that when there's 500 private property owners along the ditch. Are you going to try to have a lawsuit with each one of those? People because they're not going to relinquish their land. So that's going to tie that up forever. Um, you know, there was an effort to behind the scenes pipe the ditch that <laughs> fell through. Um, and a couple of people ended up having some ethics uh, combinations from that then for which they had to to uh, go through some training. So my purpose of coming here tonight is I'm not against strong crops born here which are seven years. My wife's family has been here for five generations. So, you know, we have a stake in the field. And I want to know if you're planning on the stormwater improvement, what specifically, item by item, do you plan on doing? In other words, we want to build this and it costs this much. We want to do this and it costs this much. Let's itemize these things and find out just what's going on instead of saying, we're going to take all your money and do with it whatever we feel like doing. That's one. I was <laughs> in reference to the bird eye situation. I told our city manager this week, I said, um, he sent out a memo of all the everything, the preparations. I'm like, the word ditch is not in your preparations. <laughs> and they sent it out. And basically, it's a private property issue, the ditches. I said, do you know about the Dudley settlement? <laughs> Because it's not so private when you settle with, and they're with unincorporated Washoe County. But when the ditches flow, you know, it who's who's paying? Washoe County. Yeah, Washoe County. Yeah. And Steve did too. And Steve Oak Ditch Company. Also, no, I, just another thing to add that development that you spoke um, there was a point where they wanted to use the Steamboat Ditch for their for their drainage. Did that go through? The um the one on the I guess the south side of the freeway. That's where the flood is. Yeah. So they wanted to you now is it been proved that they can use the steamboat dish? I I, their, I, their I cannot re remember. I mean that's gonna go by my house too. <laughs> <laughs> then one other thing we got was um Desert Research Institute did a study on using ditches for for um stormwater and they advised the young that are filled in and are not stretching sound. Yeah, yeah, floors. yeah. So um, that's why Steve tried backdoor piping. Yeah, but, yeah. So so now that that created a big uproar for people that wanted to recreate on the ditch and environmentalists that enjoy the ditch and homeowners and all of that. Yeah. So what exactly is the plan for the ditch? Well, you know, the ditch as conveyances. Uh, would could be part of the infrastructure, but I'm going to ask Tyler to send out to everyone because there is a capital programs list. You know, it's not as detailed as you got Tom Wall or even our own capital improvement plans that we take in budget, but it was much more conceptual. Can you find at minimum 
let the staff who made themselves unavailable today at, by direction of the manager that we want to see the distribute to this meeting the capital improvement plan that you know came up with the big number because it, it is in there i found it in there yeah you know what i walked down here without the glasses bill Hudson. um but you know they do read a couple of the topics what do they say uh so number one dry creek repairs reno tata airport still our owns project costs yeah. 2300 uh capital projects flood um go down to that line. so the biggest uh number in there is replace downtown flood walls at 56 mil Riverside pump at 14 mil. There's one for new flood walls, Riverside and all DTR lands at uh, what's that, 33 million. Um, they do have it broken out at annual cost and fiscal year expenditures and things like that. It's, I think it looks like it's probably two or three years old, but I think it's at least where the genesis of the stormwater. Yeah, the numbers. From. Yeah. And and we can put this back on the agenda next month too. If we only have fire coming, maybe or police, maybe um, maybe uh, the staff can make themselves available. Um, but I do think, and we can talk specifically about the ditch infrastructure, the Ward One projects in the stormwater utility. Yeah, we'll see if there's a ditch in here. So there's uh, Thomas Creek asking. Well, so much of it. Yeah, just, just for information that most people don't ever realize is that so much of the ditch and land is actually owned by homeowners and property owners and not anybody. Oh, yeah. yeah. So it's not an easement? It is. Are they for irrigation? Right? Okay. For irrigation. For irrigation. Okay. Oh, the race of great way modern the parcel now is a seasonal easement exclusive to the steamboat ditch company uh -huh. for the movement, transportation of irrigation water. Irrigation water. Between April that's and November. And that's it. So the rest of the time is. So there's no rights in the city or county house other than they bought it. I just want to privilege yeah. from the district. I just want to mention something. This is public yeah. comment for three minutes. We've gone over yeah. the three yeah. minutes, but it's been conversation back and yeah, forth. Right. So yeah. we're going to stop the public comment, but Jerry has a yeah. comment. And, and I mean, I think we have to realize here that uh, the districts are an obvious part of the stormwater system, and as they should be. But they are a really important open space and recreational resource in the city. They represent some of the only riparian habitat during the summer months. And they have evolved into a much larger resource than simply moving irrigation water a few months a year and helping out the stormwater. And as you found out three years ago when they tried to fight it. So let's let's not pretend that these ditches are only there for the conveyance of water. They they provide a lot more to the community than just that. Yeah, and, and you know, I, I was somewhere and I saw a model where an open space program, you know, Little Carson has a wonderful open space program. They buy land, they maintain it and everything. They tax themselves for it. You don't have that in there. It's very unfortunate. They have it up in Truckee. I think it's a reason why our quality of life here is not as high as it could be and is it's, it's not trending as well as it should be. But you can marry up two funding sources. You, you can marry up and get an open space program that was funded with a stormwater utility. And sometimes the same, you know, project can be one can serve two purposes, just like the RTC bridge projects, our transportation projects. And flood control projects. Okay, so, I mean, the city basically yeah, so, well, we took it for stormwater. Why can't they take it for open space? So this is public comment. Okay, so yeah, what we're going to okay. do is we'll just, in the future when this when this comes back on our agenda again, I would invite you guys to come back and make public comment again and talk and listen to what we're doing. And as it as it moves forward, and it's created, then we'll see where it yeah. goes. But. I just have to keep it on track as with public comments. Any other public comment? Would anyone else in the room like to give public comment? Would anyone on Zoom like to give public comment? If you'd like to give comment, please use the raise hand function in your Zoom feature. We have no more public comment, Mr. Chair. All right, next item is item F, adjournment. This is actually for possible actions. 
I move we adjourn. All right. I second. Thank you. And you all those in favor? Aye. 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 A